Hi guys, so this is the second podcast with me and Jasper and we just looked at what I thought was actually a really interesting conversation. It was like uh, really in depth, it went really far. I was quite philosophical um, and it was basically about comparison versus competitiveness and are these things healthy or unhealthy and how we could maybe make them more healthy or how we could focus on them in our lives in a productive and meaningful way but like I think what really comes out in this is you know it is down to the person and you're experiencing and uh, finding your own journey with these things but I think it's quite interesting because i kind of do kind of view it as quite a toxic thing this competitiveness but also a really beneficial thing to growth and you know it it covers questions like should you compare yourself or compete with others in your gym or in those places around you but towards the end it gets pretty existential um but yeah i hope you like it enjoy welcome to real coaching radio the podcast for coaches by coaches we are here to teach you how to get the most out of your clients and yourself. This is where beauty meets the beast, brains meet brawn, and science meets, well, bro science. Welcome to Real Coaching Radio. I cycle into work yeah. and I'll race people and they're not even aware of it <laughs> like dust cars. them off the lights that yeah. sort of thing like and I find it as a good a good driver to be motivated yeah I find for me the comparison like I compare myself against people in such negative ways it's a weird like so you think the comp- competition is more healthy than the comparative elements yes 100% okay, especially with social media and stuff but yeah. yeah that is interesting yeah I would say I'd probably I'm probably the, now I'm pretty bad with both actually. Mm. I'm pretty good with, no, I, actually no, maybe I agree with you. I think I'm pretty good with competition that I just, I compete when I'm not gonna win. <laughs> so like, it gets me driven to get to particularly lofty goals. Yeah. Like I have ridiculous goals, goals yeah, that yeah. are probably unattainable. Yeah. But in my head I'm like, I'm gonna do it. I'm, and that's only because I think I can. Yeah. Um, I tend to find when it gets more specific, when I'm like, literally. So as soon as I saw that guy, um, I mean, the guy you're going up against. Yeah, the guy I was going up against. I was like, that changed my perspective of Mm. my competitiveness because I was like, ah, well, now I have to think about it in terms of a person and a number. Whereas before it was just like a concept. Mm. Um, I like it. It's a goal, it's something to drive towards. But the only thing is, um, especially when we're talking about actual competitions, it never is just a guy and a number. There's so many other influences in that yeah. moment. So it's quite hard to be like, I'm competing against this number or this guy. Mm. But then on the day, it might be dehydration. That beats you, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But yeah, okay. I think I agree. I think comparison generally leads me to being more unhappy than competition. Today's episode, we're going to be looking at comparison versus competition and yeah. are these traits healthy yeah. to have it's me and chris again today one more round wearing the same outfits can you believe it charlie did cardio yesterday and he's still paying for it <laughs> still can't breathe um yeah let's we've you, you know we've briefly spoken about it you've done it on other podcasts mm. but just take us through your competitive history okay yeah so I was a competitive powerlifter. I mean, technically I still am a competitive or will be again a competitive powerlifter. But for first time I competed was like 2016. And um, that took me to the British Championships in the GBPF and I won the British Championships that year, which is kind of what I was talking about then actually. Um, More about you're not competing against the persons, you're competing against yourself and and performing well on the day um and i did see a lot slight side tangent a lot of people there not perform very well because of non-competitive reasons such what as what aspects of you know you say it's not against you're not competing against the people but the 
atmosphere like yeah what, can you elaborate what you mean by that yeah so like things that you if you're ever competing you know uh, there's a 50 50 split you know in terms of how you perform 95 percent has already been done you've already trained you've already prepared i mean obviously how well is the deciding factor yeah but the work is already done so when you're going in the 50 50 split goes well 50 percent was the preparation and 50 percent is how you deal with the atmosphere the, the the day um especially in a weigh-in sport one of the big problems people have is they're obviously trying to get into a lower weight category and this is like a big debate that has had should you naturally let your weight category be wherever you're at and not really cut and be like less competitive for a better healthier longevity result or should you really try and cut be more competitive and go for those better numbers at your weight class so obviously i was in that weight class and i saw people cut to my weight class and one of the biggest things i saw people fuck up on multiple times was a big tactic as everyone knows from seeing like conor mcgregor and everything looking like a skeleton skeletor is you do these big cuts but in weight in powerlifting it's not that aggressive because it's you know a two hour weigh in so you weigh in and then two hours later you're lifting so it's not like a 24 hour one like mma or ufc but a big thing is people manipulate water mm. So they'll do a weigh-in where they um, essentially will control dehydration and use sodium and stuff to basically like rinse themselves. So just before you drink loads and loads and loads of water all the way up to, and then the day before you stop drinking water and your body just fucking flushes all the water out and you become really dehydrated, but you lose loads of weight really quickly. You can lose like crazy amounts of weight, like five kilos, mm. crazy amounts. And you can do this with just playing with salt and water. And that's a big tactic, especially for the lighter weight lifters, because you obviously don't have much to play with. You yeah, can't walking you down as a 60 kilo fat. lifter yeah. and weighing at 55. So what will happen with that though, is if the excitement and the nervousness gets to you, your body's already overstimulated. You probably haven't had very good sleep. Um, you probably haven't eaten for a long time now. And I think that like a big problem with that is what can happen is you don't rehydrate properly and you'll get bad muscle cramping you just won't be able to perform and once you get to that stage you almost definitely can't come back from it like i've seen people that once they quads cramp your squats are done yeah you're done now yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. you can't you can't literally can't squat a heavy weight you're in too much pain i've had my back cramp before and you know it, it's just like you know you're almost a victim of the circumstance because because your body is so nervous and hyper stimulated and stuff like you can drink too much caffeine you can not eat enough fuel so you just uh, you know you don't have the ability to perform very well and also you you play games like people will compete against each other so they see somebody and instead of thinking about themselves and being like i want to secure my place or secure whatever on my leaderboard on the leaderboard they'll be like I'm going to go for something that's too big for me or really heavy to compete with another lifter. I actually did this in my second comp. So the, the next year or the year after I competed again and I was competing with a lifter and it was down to the deadlift. And essentially it was like, if I pulled it, I won. If he pulled it, he won. And like, because I probably took too big a jump, I lost, lost that deadlift and I came second that year. And if I was to do that again, I would have been more conservative and I probably would have then won the deadlift because I actually ended up missing the lift mm. rather than getting another score in the tank, whereas he got a score in the tank, which obviously. Um, so yeah, so basically from my personal experience of truly competitive history, like we did the CrossFit comp and stuff, that was more fun. But from proper competitions like the British and stuff, a lot of it is your mindset compared to the atmosphere, the moment, uh, even mind games between other people like there can be an environment in the back room where there it can feel quite intimidating it can feel quite challenging you see some people really take it seriously and they really are like headphones in look like they're gonna kill you even mm. though they're just lifting weights against you and it's not that serious bro but to be the best yeah it potentially does need to be that serious well for those people that's how they get into that mindset i'm always 
like well you've seen me i obviously get to like the feral rabbit stage where i'm walking up and down looking like i'm gonna kill someone but i'm very friendly around it Mm -hmm. but in the moment i have to get into a certain mindset of stimulation a certain aggressiveness a certain whatever um and i think it's clear that that's a massive benefit to me and without creating that neuro stimulus without being like thinking the things in my head that i be i think like you know imagine how fucking cool a world would be where you did this or imagine you know like imagine the person that you could be if you did this and things like that um and just being like you know treating yourself like i'm the most badass fucker in this room and that's how i'm gonna win that is arguably one of the key points to winning because like i said 95 percent of the work is done physically so now it's you controlling your brain state and your physiology next to your neurology like trying to bring them together to be like okay how do i commit to the intention of making my body perform in the way that i want it to perform yeah yeah so it doesn't sound obviously you know being competitive people that are competitive want to win yeah yeah there yeah. are games within that you know powerlifting people play to gain an advantage that yeah. are unhealthy like yeah. cutting huge amount of weight you know stimulating yourself past a point where they start cramping and yeah, yeah. you know actually end up losing because of that drive mm-hmm. would you say that high level sports tend to dictate uh, sorry produce unhealthy competitive habits like if you look at you know ronnie coleman after bodybuilding like he was huge he was like the king Mm -hmm. he's now Mm -hmm. broken yeah you know the amount of time that people have to commit to doing like to win um iron man's you know Mm -hmm. they end up with like broken bodies afterwards you know they're just wrecked because of the sheer volume that is required to be the best at that sport yeah i think uh there's a simple fact which is the best at anyone in the game except maybe like spiritual teachers and then even arguably there's been some pretty crazy examples of them making cults and things like that uh what's his name so show or i can't i can't remember he had a cult in america um yeah i think to be the best at anything there is a pretty unhealthy mindset that goes into it um and I don't think you should dress it up. Like, I think these people live and breathe what they do at a certain level. And I think they've got there because they were willing to do what other people haven't done. Yes, there's genetics. Yes, there's drugs involved. But like, even that, when you think about it, is a choice based on an unhealthy mindset. You're willing to take drugs to potentially harm your body to win. That means you're putting this thing first over your own health. Uh, and I think that even in these sports that are not but like as there isn't like a monetary gain like powerlifting like the esteem and the 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 personal journey it like feels like a part of it is you have to make sacrifice and those sacrifices could be things that are overall good things for human beings like you know this is where it gets complicated like friendships community all those aspects they can be a big part of these these sports but when you get to the top level it can actually be pretty lonely i think because you have to focus in on what you're doing treat everyone else like the enemy you have to maybe close off friends who encourage you to go out drinking and stuff because you want to do these other things instead and i think ultimately like yeah the mindset is pretty unhealthy and i think there's been even books on people like usain bolt and stuff uh and it was a good thing like ronnie common's a good example because he obviously really fucked up his body and he he maybe is the goat one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time and arguably like no one will ever be as good as that again but then you see someone like dorian yates who was disgustingly unhealthy bodybuilder like he was like dark ogre golem man and now he's like spiritually enlightened mushroom taking really like peaceful kind person who's like a spiritual teacher and he and he's he decided from his horrifically unhealthy lifestyle to to be the best to then switch to a really healthy lifestyle and be really like work on those internal things and work yeah. on being a good person so short answer is to be the best at things this might be business this may be whatever sadly comp- 
competition requires ego and ego is often requires selfishness and that selfishness is on often you know has some toxic elements that will produce unhealthy habits and it doesn't mean that you are evil or or bad or these people are like but they're just willing to do something that you're not um and may never do so yeah i think competition is not always but at the top levels is is pretty toxic okay so if we bring it back to you know your gym area mm -hmm. you know we train members train at the gym that kind of thing mm -hmm. to what degree is competitive like the competitiveness of people a benefit is it healthy is it going to improve yeah. their training you know we everyone will see on social media those ego lifts where people are trying to rip a silly weight off the ground like hitching ridiculous. it up or yeah. that video where someone tried to box squat too much and basically got pinned to the box yeah, and stuck you know it. being too driven to lift too heavy or yeah. obviously it's negative but what are the positive things about being competitive that you can utilize in your training see that's interesting because then i would make a distinction between competitiveness and ego even though competitive competitiveness requires fundamentally an egotistical perspective it's about you in the framework of wants and what you desire and it's very like selfish driven I think it's hard to be like empathetically competitive. That's a weird thing. I think you can be empathetic and competitive, but I think competition is fundamentally egotistical. But you can also be egotistical without being competitive and it can be more toxic that way. So like if we were talking about ego lifting, where you're just trying to lift the heaviest weight, you're just trying to be like, I'm just so strong. And but you're not really competing against anyone. You're just fundamentally being one ignorant of your own ability which is just not helpful when you're lifting dangerous or doing dangerous things um and i think it's more like in that sense you're just kind of like showing off for clout it's not that you're competing against someone it's that you're being arrogant in that way so those ego lifts is a kind of showmanship and arrogance it's, it's not competitiveness whereas like competitiveness whether it's towards an ideal so i want to be the best at this thing or specifically against another person so let's talk about in the gym mm. let's say you've got a person in the gym uh the at the moment they're stronger than you and you're like i, I just want to be stronger than them like they're my target to yeah. be i want to be stronger than them is that a good thing to have i think it's a good thing to have okay. i think it's fundamentally important for you to have um tangible goals to work towards and it being represented even secretly in another person is like it's not unhealthy like don't treat that person badly don't like don't like be outwardly competitive with them but like me and jasper are competitive right i, I will do something because jasper's done it i will do i will go and lift something because i want to lift more than jasper yeah. i will aim for goals because jasper's done something um we're best friends we live together like i love him but it doesn't mean that he doesn't drive me to try and be better at what i'm doing and beat him <laughs> yeah. but like it's healthy it's yeah. a healthy relationship to have that and ultimately it drives us to both be better versions of ourselves with like we're saying you can be empathetic and and competitive and it, it it's nothing about the person it's not to do with the, it's jasper it's to do with he is a tangible figure mm. that i can work towards and i think everyone should have that to a degree uh realistically who is in your ballpark you know even maybe maybe not maybe even people that are totally out your ballpark and you're just using them as a target you know maybe you want to win the olympia and you're like chris bumstead's the goal bro yeah yeah do or die chris bumstead and maybe that's your goal you would probably you're probably an idiot but if you don't have that goal you won't beat Chris Bumstead. You won't ever reach that height. So you do have to, I would say- It's a little bit us, you know, we jokingly, but kind of like at the same time, we'd definitely go for it. Yeah. Have the joke about kind of, oh, we'll go to the CrossFit Games one go day. Go to the CrossFit Games, you know, bro. The, one day. Won't win it. There's no way that's gonna happen. No way that's gonna happen. But to no. qualify as achievement in itself. Yeah. Um, and it's a tangible goal that may seem unrealistic but it's 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 something to strive for so that lower le i'm saying lower level of competition you know the slightly less obsessively destructive competitiveness yeah is obviously a healthy trait 
but is almost set entirely around goal setting yes yeah so yeah. how would you channel that competitiveness like side story I've seen someone me and my girlfriend are very competitive and I have literally watched her cry because she lost at Mario Kart <laughs> sorry Danny um, <laughs> because she didn't have one when she that's was younger that's not so healthy um, yeah but obviously that's kind of like very unstructured you know just in the moment how would you help someone channel competitiveness into a form of goal that is you know achievable measurable attainable mm. because you know chasing Chris Bum said we're trying to qualify to the CrossFit Games when we don't actually have any CrossFit comms planned we have no soon, tangible apart goal apart from yeah. Waterpalooza 2023 here we go um, Miami baby qualifiers let's say because it'll be 2024 we go yeah. if we go when we start working towards that <laughs> so you know apart from just having random things thrown out there how would you help someone structure that to channel that so this is where it's the, I think it's good we can compare competitors to comparison yeah um you shouldn't compare yourself to others i don't think i think comparison comparison is the thief of joy famous quote comparison is the what am i and why am i not like that so it's like why are they like that why am i not like that um, whereas competitiveness is I want to be like that or I want to be better than that or I can be better than that I, like I would say I, I would really channel the, the thought I have when I'm competitive is I can do that and I can be better than that um, that is tangible but it's not a person whereas when you're comparing yourself you're in a situation where you've had this total, total different life experience to this other person but this person is fundamentally what you want or you're saying that what they have is better or whatever and you're you know this is the thing with social media it's like such a a snapshot of of who they are they could be like struggling horrifically with their mental health but you see them on a holiday in sunny places all the time and you're like oh god look look at what a great life they have and then you're comparing and putting down your own experience to them because one most of the good things we see in other people are snapshots so they're not all the time um no one ever really posts the bad stuff yeah. or the missed lifts or yeah. the time they miss their flight that kind of thing or they only do it once they've achieved good things yeah. and they go look at how far i've come um but i think comparison is a da is a dangerous thing because on the on the daily i compare myself to people and it makes me feel shitter on the daily but i don't think that the comparisons are ever tangible because they're like conceptually things i can't even their goals i can't even reach they're being things that i'm not even able to be so it's not like here's a tangible goal in weightlifting it's like why am i not more like this mm. and i think that that's the difference like in your gym or as a fitness goal you shouldn't be comparing to somebody for the quality of their character and saying like why am i not more disciplined why am i not more um you know sociable why am i not more whatever it is but you should be being like how could i be more this thing how could i be more this thing and if you're looking at somebody else and taking them as a blueprint i think you fall into this dangerous category because like i said their pathway is so invisible to you and it could be so specific down to the genetics plus the upbringing plus the the money they had plus whatever it is whereas the physical achievements you could be like okay they move better in this way or they have better mobility they're tangible things you but can you can never you might never be able to achieve that you know, yeah we spoke that about is Joe true yeah that's true previous podcast that he's got like crazy hip mobility yeah and i'm there feeling like i'm ass to grass and my hips are four feet off the floor yeah. because i yeah, just yeah, don't have true. that hip mobility so would you deter people from setting these like outcome goals where it's all about what they have and you don't or this thing you're trying to achieve rather than it being like a process or performance goal where you've got more control over what you're trying to achieve over taking or beating someone at something where there's you know take powerlifting you can go and perform to your absolute best you mm. can hit the numbers you were aiming for mm. but you can't really control what your competitor does Absolutely. so you can't control the outcome you can put you can control the effort you put in the training your like process yeah. towards the goal 
and your performance on the day, you know, not being overly competitive to cut to a crazy category rather than going where you should go. Where you should sit, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's it. It's like the, you know, it almost is like uh, so cliche. Why are we even doing a podca- podcast on it? But the, where it leads to an interesting conversation is the cliche part is you really should be comparing yourself to yourself, comparing yourself to yourself. Mm. Um, however, the, the competitiveness or the competition element is out of yourself is external the comparison should be internal am i a better version of the person i was before the competitor this should be external can i beat this person or like achieve this goal or rise to this height and i think if you you know look at comparisons as an external thing why am i not like this you know why are they better than me why do they get all this and i don't then you're going to lead just to envy and and disappointment and that's because the the goal that you're setting with comparison is fantasy it doesn't mm-hmm. exist you're comparing yourself to the ethereal perfect other that they are not mm-hmm. they're not that person that you think they are they are a totally different person in their head in their parents head and every single person that sees them sees them in a different way you're seeing them in this perfect light because truly you want those things you're disappointed in yourself that you don't have those things but by comparing yourself constantly like that there's always going to be the fantastical other that has all the things that you don't have whereas competitive wise you do have like a tangible goal it's like this is the best you could be yeah. You know, if you beat Usain Bolt, you are the fir- fastest person on the planet. That's it. Goal ended. Done. Like that is like a tangible thing where you could be like, and so the, the, the counter argument would be, well, what if you just can't ever reach these competitive goals? Isn't that going to give you a life of disappointment or isn't it going to give you like... So how do you approach that, you know most of us if even if we took all the gear and performance hands drugs in the world yeah. would never run fast and use him but it's genetically not there a lot a lot of people might be in a sport or a role where they won't be the best but they might be driven to be the best how can they find a sense of achievement in that sport or career yeah it it's an interesting balance like i've heard people talk about it a lot like I heard them talk it on the Mark Bell podcast and they were talking about how, well, if you don't aim for the best people in the world, if you don't say I'm going to be the best in the world, you can't be, it's impossible. You have to have the mindset of I'm going to be the fucking best at this thing in the entire world. or I'm going to be the whatever it is. But I think it's about a mixture of having that background self-assuredness and confidence, but that's more like an intention. It's more like, the intention is reach for the stars, you know, whatever that is. And that you, you could be like, for me and Jasper could be like, we're going to go to the CrossFit Games. That is quite intangible, right? Um, and if we filmed, you know, a vlog of us going to that point, let's say we actually did go to the CrossFit Games. Like Zach, uh, Zach George did something pretty similar to this, I'm pretty sure. Like, you know, from fat to really good CrossFit, uh, I can't remember exactly, but- It took uh, him a while to get there. He- Yeah, but there was, like a, there was like an unachievable goal and he basically achieved it. Yeah. Right, so if you followed the story from start to finish, in hindsight, you'd be like, oh, look at all these steps that they took. But it started from an unrealistic goal of them being like, I'm gonna do this thing that seems so unrealistic. But then how do you make that constructive and tangible is that you have to compartmentalize the goals. You have to be like, the first step is I'm gonna be the best person in my gym. Yeah. I'm gonna be the best snatcher in my gym. I'm gonna be the best back squat in my gym. It might even be, I feel like for me is a great one. You know, I'm always gonna keep this one because it keeps me winning. Uh, <laughs> I have the best pound for pound lift in the gym Yeah, for each thing. And like that is, a goal and like you could then compare that well in crossfit that doesn't matter it's not a pound for pound sport it's not weight you know it's not weight categories but it's and it's a it's a focused goal for now and then the next thing might be like i just want the biggest squat in the gym mm. doesn't matter how big mark is <laughs> <laughs> we are coming for you <laughs> yeah like do you know, it is like um i have to apologize charlie's got the biggest squat in the gym at the moment so you know just like uh, i suppose done in the gym yes yeah um, but yeah, so I think it is about compartmentalizing and making it more realistic to your knowing where you're at and being like, okay, where's the next step? Um, 
and setting like shorter term goals. Yeah. You know, if we use this idea of us going to cross the games, we should probably have a go at the open this year. Yeah. As a placing and then probably start looking at other comps local and, comps yeah. as experience because we've done one crossfit comp yeah. and the next step is the crossfit games yeah perfect i think yeah. there's a clear clear but then so yeah but there's so, also sorry you know there's also metrics we can go off by we know roughly the number that most and, crossfit games athletes can snatch 120 clean yeah. jerk 140 and then you know have certain fitness levels mm -hmm. and strength levels that we and you know obviously this is the skills you need to be able to do to kind of give us a ballpark of like we might never have competed but we can do all these things that yeah. you could probably then just qualify yeah that's true i mean yeah that uh, so but like a point i think is interesting is to be reflective on from my point of view and to ask you as well like what if and we can talk about the counter arguments but what if you do set these goals and you just quite simply due to misfortune or whatever like you just can never reach those even prospectively to the, to the end, upper end of your goals what if you know, for whatever reason which we can talk about in a minute for whatever reason you go i'm going to win my local powerlifting meet and you just never you just never win it you spend your whole time really fighting for this thing and you just never get it um, been there <laughs> yeah. so I mean well you know you can answer as well but did trampolining that was my old sport yeah um, wanted to be the best yeah like had the potential to be the best like I could do I had the power on the trampoline to do the skills there's something called skill loss in trampolining where you just have a some sort of like mental block with a skill that can you know cripple careers and I spent a long time reworking through skills and mm -hmm kind of got to the point where I was like going round and round like building the skills back up get to a certain point lose a couple of skills come back round again and made the decision to move on from that sport yeah. and I think when you get that sort of thing whether you keep chasing it or not it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier looking back on what you've done and achieved and from going through those processes of having to learn to deal with failure and stuff mm -hmm. that you might have to shift your goal to something new yeah. that you didn't think was you know mine's gone from trampoline to weightlifting and mm -hmm. that kind of crossfit style stuff mm -hmm. but you've got the framework and the like structure of how you train and how you deal with failure to make you even better at the next thing yeah i mean i think you know that was it's like you knew my answer mm -hmm. um at the end of the day the thing about the the drive through competitiveness is even if the actual intention is missed, you're off the mark, you know, like without even taking the piss, like obviously if you have some disability, you can't get to a certain level in some sports, it's impossible. Yeah. You could go into a, a disabled version and you could be really good at that. But even then there's some fantastically, ridiculously strong athletes mm. in those disabled categories. You just might not, you might be, have just more of a neurological problem than they do. Yeah, and then you just, yeah don't have the ability so and it's done in categories where you might be the lower end of what that kind of able yeah yeah so yeah. you know there'll be people that are less a more able than you but still disabled yeah yeah so you physiology physiologically can't beat them but like obviously that's just a very visceral example of like you can think about it in those terms but it like that is the scale of life that's got nothing to do with disability or not that's to do with like we are all in some way uh, have more of a disability in some areas than somebody else does um, and we just might not be able to compete in the same ranges as people who have certain skills like I have terrible ability to focus am I gonna be the most focused driven person on the planet with certain aspects of academia or, or whatever no it's never gonna happen it doesn't matter how much Adderall I'll take I'll probably just <laughs> clean my room and then make it messy again looking for something in it like it's just never gonna it's never gonna be that but let's say that was my goal striving for that goal would build certain resiliences and certain like talking about trampolining you built strength fitness and explosiveness from doing trampolining from a young age which has now mean, meant that your new goal has 
a new added benefit that you wouldn't yeah. have if you hadn't have done those things and you probably wouldn't even be where you're at today like I have this arm a tattoo on my arm that says Amor Fati which means love of one's fate it's mm. a famous quote from Friedrich Nietzsche and um, it doesn't mean I love the fatties like somebody once said <laughs> but it, it is basically um, the concept of love of one's fate is that you are where you are there was never another option you always were going to choose this path because your brain state your birth experiences your upbringing they lead you to be a certain type of person and like in the flow of the river you are the river you can only flow one way and that's downstream and you are always going to choose those decisions and although it seems like we have this incredible eclectic amount of free choice it's much smaller than you think it is. You have very few choices in the day. You tend to stick to habit patterns and, and choose one or the other. And it just seems very restricted. And generally you just pick the one, you know, we, you choose the same action. So you might just be circumstantially better at one thing than another thing. And that is your flow of life, but it might take you the competitive failure in one area to do well in another. And ironically, speaking of Friedrich Nietzsche, he had a terrible existence, a terrible existence. He was addicted to opium. He got migraines. He could never find love. He ended up like, obviously, and if you read his stuff, questionable opinions about women, but he is probably one of the most distinctive, important philosophers to modern day philosophy. And millions of people have based their whole lives off his ideas. You know, the structure of religion has changed. The structure of society has changed. And for good and evil, like even the Nazis used some of what he said for, for their goals and, and, and evil purposes. But the important part about that is in his own life, he felt his achievements were null and void. Mm. He died alone in a cabin in the woods in Switzerland and he felt horrible and he was going insane. But inadvertently in his striving for certain things, he's become one of the most influential people of our times. Now, obviously we don't want to be the guy who dies alone in the cabin in the woods. But, but the you, overarching theme of that is yeah. taking the positives out of what you've created or experienced. Exactly, and inadvertently not realizing that the striving for greatness might not lead it to the greatness in what you originally perceived or wanted. Yep. And we all know our wants are pretty fickle. They change on the daily, depending on what I've eaten, how much caffeine I've had, <laughs> who I've spoken to that day. But they might achieve to something valuable anyway. So that's kind of... Yeah. how i'd view that it sounds very you know ethereal when you you know everyone's like oh failure is just the path to success yeah yeah and <laughs> annoyingly it is but yeah. you know the more times you fuck if, up the more aware you are of what how to not fuck up yeah and like the fact that you know i never achieved my trampoline goal and spent so long trying to get through my own head you know i learned a lot about myself i also now have the ability to basically learn any skill i want to yeah just from the uh, like i can look at something i can break it down and I can filter it out into different things to yeah, make it understandable, it, yeah. you know, which has also made me a great coach. Cause yeah, people yeah. come in and, you know, you tell someone to, the famous one we talk about sometimes is get your chest up when you squat yeah. to like drive your hips through, but you could also say hips through. So it's like yeah. getting that information into something manageable for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of something on consideration of that is like the question then becomes is it worth it to leave lead a toxic existence for greatness is it worth it to be the dorian yates and literally put your entire health potentially friendships and family for an ideal that is like well it's kind of something and nothing like he was great at something did it impact people 100 percent yet did it influence people 100 percent yet did it improve the world probably not did it improve humankind probably not so is it worth it yes or like, no yeah like is it like is is that is it worth like obviously someone like nikola tesla or or someone who's like achieving something that greatens the scope of humanity it, it seems more tangible that we can all agree that the greatness com achieved through competitiveness is valuable to everyone but when it's something that's so personal is it worth it being toxic is it worth it having the negatives what do you think 
I'd love to know your answer as well, but I think it depends on what you've got going in your life yeah. in the sense of if you have no like family as in like wife and kids, you obviously might have brothers and sisters and mum and dad and stuff and, and like your friendship group and stuff and your work, like how much are you willing to sacrifice to achieve what, you know, if we keep it in athletic sense, your sporting potential, mm -hmm. you know, Ben Bergeron talks a lot in his podcast, Chasing Excellence about, you know, managing his time and he's got this like rigid set not rigid but like structured life where you know he just turns everything off at five o'clock and goes home and he doesn't you know his family is more important than his business mm. you know and you can play that in with your you know sports that he mentions that you know if you imagine you've got four balls to juggle or even three balls of like glass balls you know you've got family career and your sport passion yeah yeah you know those three Health. if you drop one of them it's going to get cracked it's not going to break but it's going to get cracked and it mm -hmm. won't be you can't repair a glass ball necessarily yeah so if you drop your you know family in the sense of that it's not a priority and your career just for that sport you are damaging things that potentially can't be undone for the goal of something that you may never achieve yeah so, so true um so it's a paradox it's a catch-22 may never have it but have to strive for it 100 percent to get it even though you may never have it. And that's at the risk of other positive things in your life. Um, obviously the healthy part of my brain is like, a life is about balance. It's about, you should be able to do as many things as possible in the right dosages. However, I have never been a balanced person. And I personally have found balance very hard. Um, and I haven't found that much personal enjoyment or um, feeling of achievement or feeling of like filling my void the filling the the void of existence I think comes with like a, a certain level of complete dedication to a task like um, so to mix in two quotes together the one that I spoke about on another podcast, the Jimmy Carr one, enjoying the passing of time. Mm. And another one from uh, another philosopher I mentioned on a previous podcast that is my favorite philosopher, but a different quote was from Albert Camus, the myth of Sisyphus, which is a treatise he wrote philosophically. And the idea was that Sisyphus, for those who don't know, was um, cursed by the Greek gods after he upset them, annoyed them, was did lots of selfish things to permanently roll a boulder up a hill and when it got to the top of the hill it would roll back down and he would did that in a lonely mountain for eternity by himself and Albert Camus likened this to the existence of man so he was saying that man has this deep uh, need for meaning to find purpose in life and to be the one special snowflake. to be the really special the, the story whatever there's a god there's an afterlife there's a meaning there's a purpose and the truth is there is actually nothing there is no meaning it's a blank void universe that you just so happen to be conscious in and what he was saying is this is an absurd leap a big jump that there's no meaning but we need meaning so how do you cross this jump well you have to fill it with your meaning you have to create you have the power to create and from that creation you can find fulfillment and, and meaning and what he said is that on this dark mountain with him rolling up this boulder that the what we w must imagine sisyphus happy and if you read the longer quote he's basically saying he in this godless void he could find m meaning in every particle of that plane of existence in every bit of effort he put in rolling that boulder up the hill in the sight looking over the mountain as he got to the top of the hill and you know the strive for maybe getting up that mountain a bit quicker next time or whatever it is you know if we're just like thinking about it in a fitness term but the idea i think that comes from that is that i think that the need to create meaning or the, the the fulfillment of life is to fill your time with as much positive energy and striving for something great as possible that even if some other people might view it as toxic or negative or whatever 
if it feels your whole existence and you feel satisfied and fulfilled then what other people might value as more important or the the globally traditionally important things might not be that important to you and that might really sound horrible like oh maybe i would choose this over my family or whatever but it's not about that you can still have family and still have love and you can still have all these things but if these things fill your life maybe they are the priority because maybe and i think that a lot of people could probably recognize this most people have family most people fall in love at some point most people have friends and even despite that live in lots of moments of unhappiness in lots of moments of unfulfillment in lots of moments of meaningless lots of people are very depressed with close family members they're very depressed with um being in love they could be feel trapped in relationships or whatever but if someone feels completely in adoration and um fulfilled by the activity they choose to do on a daily basis it could one color all these things in a better light they could be way more satisfied with their family with their love with their whatever um even if it might mean one of them is less good or less focused on but if their whole life is filled to the day they die and they they sit on their deathbed and they go wow that was quite a ride i would choose that over like the but it's the right thing to do to focus on balance and but i think that's just who you ask in terms of yeah definitely, what your definitely. upbringing and construct of society is like in the sense that loads of people you know doctors and bankers and that sort of thing yeah work themselves to death to earn money to never spend until they're old because yeah. they're too busy working or you know stay at home parents and look after three kids and yeah. their entire existence is their children and they can't slightly different because they're impacting their lives but and they might they might find the ultimate fulfillment from bringing yeah up so kids. you never know what is someone's driver but then would you say that it's yeah go on about having that sense of achievement in whatever you're doing to keep that excitement and joy and and drive i think it's about recognizing that the only person living your life is you so that means that the things that fundamentally fill your time with meaning and happiness should be dictated by you you should listen to your gut feeling you should listen to your intuition what do i enjoy doing i enjoy doing this i should spend as much time doing this as possible and you know there is balance but you live the same day a million times you live the day over and over again another nietzschean concept you know if a demon appeared to you one day and said to you you're going to live this life for the rest of eternity you're going to live it you're going to get to the end of it you're going to live it again and you have to just eternally live the same exact life the same exact choices what choice would you make on that day what choice would you choose after hearing that and it's the same as memento mori one day you will die the bad my first thought was go to the gym <laughs> well no because that's the thing that fills your life with meaning like this is where Sorry, people don't understand <laughs> but, no, but this is like if well, this is where people don't understand yeah. when they people look at me like why are you so obsessive why do you just choose the gym over this why do you it's like because this keeps me one that completely sane and lets the rest of my life fall into place but also it's because i find purpose in it i find focusing on these competitive goals one by one fills my week fills my month fills my year instead of feeling aimless and and confused and apathetic i feel driven and that might seem non-important to some people but your thing might be different from our thing and i guarantee if you have your thing i might not understand it you know like i might not be driven by antique stamp collection no, that might not drive me, but that might fill your life with meaning trying to get the rarest stamp in the world. Yeah. And like, fair play to you if that fills your life with meaning. That would be a bit of a weird one to say you choose over your family. But, you know, like, it, it's all relative. And I think that, you know, like the Memento Mori thing, one day you will die, so what will you choose next? I think you should just always choose next something that will fundamentally fill your life with meaning and your own happiness. And I think that, you know, to slightly backtrack, that would include balance mm. at points. Like you can't always be training because you would overtrain. You can't always be, you know, uh, doing these other things because you'll burn out. So you need these recoveries. You need to feel socialized and all that because you're a human being. So that requires you having balance with your friends and family, even if your priority is 70% this driven goal. But then that would be some sort of like healthy variation, whereas lots yeah. of people overexercise, under eat to attain, attain this body dysmorphia fantasy of being shredded when they already are really lean they're trying to get one percent less yeah. 
and that sort of thing um i want to draw it back to social media yeah in terms of it can be a great way of motivating yourself to go and be better Mm -hmm. but most of the time is this horrible thing where people compare themselves to everyone on social yeah, media the comparison thing yeah. that they're never going to be as good they're never going to be as strong or as successful and that sort of thing or have as many followers and yeah so that's the other thing it's not even it could even be like the amount of likes this person has on their post is dictating how you feel about your own life that is so ridiculous i mean you know we've done the same you make every day make a great reel every day. blows up you're like oh that was so good you God. make another great reel yeah it gets 200 views you're like what like I'm shit yeah and I hate myself yeah for something so ridiculous that is didn't exist before right um no I I I do I do agree I think that you know ultimately uh, to maybe slightly just put a perspective spin on it to to look at all signs a lot of these people who achieve greatness then go on to settle down as well they 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 get to the height. They are the Kobe Bryant, you know, RIP, but mm-hmm. they are the Kobe Bryant, they are the Michael Jordan, they are the whatever. And then they go into a life afterwards, which is a different life. They go into a life that's about family and is about health, like the, Dor- the Dorian Yates thing. You go into a life where they're thinking about like other forms of meaning and spiritualism and, and uh, friendship and community. And I think that's because at different stages in your life, like, uh, you know, we're saying this is, 20 year olds right we're very much 25 mate 25 26 actually sorry yeah Uh, yeah. we're saying this is a point of we're being like let's go out and get it and the life is very external it's very externally validating and um, Carl Jung talks about these two stages of your life where the first part of your life is an outward existence it's overcoming the dragon it's overcoming your competitive goals and then the second part of your life is internal it's learning about yourself who you are Mm. And I think it does depend where you're at in your life, maybe not a specific age, but, but it might just depend, you know. But I think, you know, the age does matter. Yeah. You know, if we're talking sports terms of like how competitive and motivated you are to commit 70, 80% of your time to that thing. It's a limited window. Exactly. Kind of That's what I was used to yeah. discuss with the guys at trampolining when we would literally be work, like coaching in the gym, yeah. training, go home, sleep. Can't really hang out with people because we work weird hours and train and social hours. But it was like, you know, I probably got until my 30s, 35 tops to get to the CrossFit Games or achieve my actual max potential before the ceiling of my strength starts to come down too much that it's going to be a limiting factor. So, you know, if you are in a position where you're doing a sport and you're you're made to like come to to the pub and you're unsure whether to go, you know, get a good night's sleep to be better at your sport, the pub will still be there when you're 35. Yeah. You know, as long as you don't burn bridges with friends, it is potentially going to be more beneficial for your long-term success and career and life to, you know, put in those years of work. Bridges with your friends, you probably won't take it easy. Bridges with your sport in the sense that no, but if it does burn it with your friends, then you should probably look at who you're hanging around with. That the one factor that they value on is going to the pub, which is just you know a place to drink alcohol, and you could do multiple other things like we Take find a friendship. caffeine and lift heavy weights yeah friends. exactly it's same, same thing different <laughs> place um, but yeah so I think that you know there is changing focuses for your life and, and I think you know this is a very westernized capitalist individualist point of view of like egotistical let's get the best ever and whatever but like I think that you can get to points in your life where you might want to just settle down and focus on you know the spiritual aspects you might want to focus on meditation you might want to focus on your family and whatever and you can still be somewhat striving for greatness in that and there could be like a competitive element of how could i get the best at meditating and finding meaning how could i get the best at looking after my family and being a good parent or a good man or a good husband or whatever so you can have different focuses but i think the primary thing is squeeze as much juice out of life as you can at all points in it yeah and because it you know we don't know what's next and and i think it's highly valuable but also you know recognize are you truly doing what you want to do for yourself or is it for somebody else and i think what the whole thing was about is comparison versus competitiveness if competitiveness leads you to greatness follow it hook line and sinker 
if you're comparing um, and it's bringing you down, it's pushing you down, and it's about others. It's about I'm doing this because I feel like this is what other people want. I dress up like this and I put on this makeup and I go to the gym to get a six pack because this is what other people want. That's the wrong way to look at it. However, if the side effect of your competitive streak leads you to looking good and feeling good and therefore maybe buying nicer clothes to go out in, it's the same outcome, but it's got a different internal form of validation. And I think that's the main focus. Is it from your own motivation and wants or is it from the external? So yes, competitive and comparison potentially is a focal point to help you grow, but don't let it be the thing that prevents you from growing or dictates your life and leads to unhappiness. What a summary. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I've kind of taken over from this. You now. crack on. Uh, I will see you in the next one. I didn't get to do this one. As you can tell, my husky voice, um, the hot and cold sweats of this illness has not let me speak properly. Um, but is competitive nature, is competition actually healthy? Um, I'm going to give my own opinion on this because no one's going to hear it to correct me, which is great. But I do actually think that the competitive nature that we all have um, within us should be found to be harnessed in some way if we can. Um, I think it's something that drives us all in some way, shape or form, whether that's driven through a bad kind of negative things or whether that's driven through positivity. Um, I think harnessing it is probably the main thing that we need to do. Um, and I'm doing this outro before I listen to it, so it'll be interesting to see what they said. Um, same as always though, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed that one. And if you do want to get in contact with any of us, um, Instagram is probably the best place you can find us. Um, so you can find Chris at the underscore symbolic underscore chimp at Jasper Schoole, at Mark Origin Series, at How the Body, How the Mind, at Real Coaching Radio, all of those good places. Same as always, five star rating review. You can do this on Spotify. It just literally says, once there's been enough ratings, we will show a rating. And obviously that's going to be five stars. So that's good. So I would say, if you can, leave a five star rating and review, screenshot their shares on your stories, same as iTunes, same as Spotify. Thank you for listening. We will see you on the next one.